Hi, I'm Gail Curl from the New Cumberland First Church of God. We are so glad that you were able to join us today for worship. I want to quickly call attention to the information in the description area of this YouTube video. You can find general information about our church and information about this specific worship service. The virtual bulletin linked in the description contains today's scriptures and sermon notes, as well as some other important information. And as usual, we truly appreciate any contributions that are made through our giving link. Any amount, large or small, can make a difference as we do our best to serve our church family and our community. Thanks again for joining us today.
Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you as sinners, but filled with the promise of your amazing grace. We take You take each one of us in our broken state, and you make us whole. You fill the holes in our hearts with words of love, and when we get lost, your light will guide us back to you. Jesus, we praise you. We turn our eyes to you in the morning and in the evening, and in the sad times and in the joyous times, because we want others to see you in our actions and in the words that we speak. We ask that you use us to show your love to those around us. Amen. Good morning. This is Charlie Zora, pastor of the New Cumberland First Church of God. I'm in our church's gathering place this morning, um, sitting by the fireplace that we never use. I'm not sure if it's usable or not, but here I am. And today's sermon title is Jesus is the Answer. And I'll be reading from Colossians chapter 1 in just a moment. Um, but if you think about our lives right now, um, you know, the lives that we know, you know, we're in South Central Pennsylvania of the United States and uh, many other places experience similar things that we do. But um, we have so many things that we have access to, so many things just striving to gain our attention. We have great foods. We have entertainment. There are books, audio books. There are podcasts, magazines, websites, YouTube, TikTok videos. Uh, places to travel on vacations. Uh, we are, you know, interested in politics, news, fake news, and now a worldwide pandemic and arguments about masks, vaccines, and mandates. And all of these things are vying for our attention and trying to pull us away from the most important thing, which is our relationship with Jesus Christ and making him known to other people. Um, there are a lot of things, you know, even as I'm sitting here right now, I'm thinking, you know, there's leftover ice cream in that freezer right over there. I just might get some of that when I'm finished here. And right over there this morning, I'm recording this actually on Monday, um, is our coffee pot in the gathering place. And many of you are familiar with that. And it malfunctioned and it squirted water all over the place. So we have to get that replaced. And um, there are just so many things that just want our attention. Um, computers, if you have a smartphone, um, these things just are calling our names all the time. So we're going to look at um, what Jesus would have us do. So uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, beginning at verse 15, 15 through 23. Verse 15, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So verse 23 is kind of interesting because it's kind of like an add-on. If you go back to verse 22, it talks about, uh, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through the death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. We'd like to end there. But in verse 23, it adds on, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope 
held out in the gospel. And, you know, we have all these distractions and a worldwide pandemic is a big part of it. And we are something, seeing something unprecedented in Christianity, I think, especially in modern Christianity, is people are leaving the, the faith, leaving the church, the body of Christ church that I'm talking about, because of the pandemic. They're, you know, realizing they'd rather do other things. There are all these things that want your attention, that want your focus, that demand you commit yourself to those things. And in that, you know, we are turning away from the church. But even within the church, we have our own problems. Um, you know, without getting into any specific faiths within the Christian realm of religions, um, we <clears throat> as Christians, and this goes back to Judaism, if you look at the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and even in Jesus' time and before, we actually like religion, we like ritual, and we like tradition to the to the point where it can condemn us. We can be so committed to these things that we will reject the true things of God. So, modern day, think about things that we know in some denominations. They do infant baptism. Show me where that is in the Bible. Uh, it's almost non-existent in Scripture. What we see is believer's baptism. We see churches doing confirmation. In fact, I think this church used to do that here. Um, so confirmation is, uh, I went through confirmation as a, a Roman Catholic, but like I said, it used to be done in this church, I'm pretty sure. It's a day where everybody is confirmed to be a Christian. It wasn't about deciding and surrendering your life. I know, because I went through it. It was about following the rules, following the tradition, you know, saying the right things. It wasn't about the heart, it was about what you physically did. Like the evidence that you are confirmed to be a Christian. You know, um, there is penance. Uh, I used to go to confession and confess my sins to a priest when I was Catholic. And he would say, for your penance, and then he would say something like, say three Our Fathers and two Hail Mary. So I would leave the confessional, the little booth, and I'd go out there and kneel in a pew, and I would do what he said. I would. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The one time my buddy Andrew, uh, we were probably like we were young uh like high school age maybe and andrew went to confession and he confessed that he had been drinking been out partying and the priest said for your penance don't drink for two weeks and ironically we had this big party planned that night and andrew didn't drink he didn't drink for two weeks but these are man-made rules and it is the works of man that you are trying to win the favor of god you know, penance, maybe uh, repentance is the word that they actually should be using because repentance is in the Bible. Penance isn't in the Bible. Well, maybe you could find it. Uh, and what about purgatory? When people die, the Bible shows us pretty clearly that when you die, you will either go to be in the presence of the Lord for all of eternity or you will be condemned for rejecting Jesus Christ as, as Lord. Purgatory, this, this like waiting, refining period, show me where it is in the Bible. Because with all of these things and more, including things that we do in our church, if it ain't in the Bible, don't believe it. You know, we have some traditions, as you're well aware if you've worshipped here, you know, and some traditions serve us well for a time, but we can't be committed to those traditions. Uh, we can't allow the traditions of man to cause divisions within the church. And, you know, you hear of worship, worship, worship wars, people fighting over music. Like Churches have split over that type of thing. People have left churches over that type of thing. And it shouldn't be. We are one body. The body cannot be divided. The things of God are more important than the things of man. You have your preferences. I understand that. I have my preferences. I understand that too. And often my preferences are not the same as your preferences. We're different. Imagine that. Uh, God made us to be different. We should embrace our differences. And it's a give-and-take world that we live in. Uh, so when we get into this discussion of traditions, let's go to Mark and look at an account of Jesus. Mark chapter 7, verses 5 to 9. It says, So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. 
These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. So uh, you might read this and think, uh, you know, I prepared this and I thought about this a lot and prayed about it. And you might think, yeah, we have traditions. You can't deny that. We have traditions, right? But our traditions don't get in the way of the law. They don't counter the law of God. I would argue with you and say there are times when they do, in fact, counter the law of God, you know, which is love and unity and peace and striving together for the mission of God, the mission that Jesus gave us to make disciples. And you might say, well, give me some examples, Pastor. I'm not going to give you many, but I will tell you, in this church, since I've been here, there were at least two times, two times that I'm aware of, where we had a visitor come into the church and sit in a pew. So they sat in a pew, like I'm sitting here right now, and somebody from our church walked up to them and said, you're sitting in my seat, or this is where I normally sit. Now, can you imagine? This is a visitor to our church. And, uh, you know, once, I think the one time happened at the early service, the other time happened at the late service. Now, if you attend the early service, I know some of you watching this do attend our early service, there aren't that many people there. There are seats all over the place. And you sit in a pew, and there are dozens dozens, maybe a hundred seats in pews available, and somebody comes up to you as a visitor and says, you're sitting in my seat. It might be your tradition to sit there, but you know what? That visitor may not know Jesus Christ as Savior. They may be seeking. I just called somebody who visited our church Sunday, and the person is hurting. They, they had a medical problem. You know, they're struggling with trying to figure his whole life out. They haven't been to church in years, and they're coming here looking for hope, looking for peace, looking for love, looking for acceptance. And somebody says, you're sitting in my seat. In fact, I have told my wife, when we visit other churches, like when I'm on vacation, I said, if anybody ever does that, says you're sitting in my seat, I'm going to stand up, walk out, and leave. Because that is so unchristian. It's not acceptable. And we should never do that type of thing. And I'm not going to get into other examples. That's just one. And I can be pretty confident in saying that the people that did that, at least the two that I know about, won't be watching this. Um, so you're, if you're watching this, you're not the one guilty of that, that I'm aware of. Uh, so I, you know, I step on toes sometimes, but I'd rather not. But let me ask you a more personal question. <laughs> and this is where the sermon gets really hard. How many coats do you own? Like how many winter coats? Or how many jackets? And you know, I'm changing my wording a little bit. How many coats and jackets do you own? Because I tried to count mine. And we have basically two closets in our house that we keep coats in. There's one, we live in a raised ranch, so you, we park in the bottom and we live up mostly upstairs. So there's a coat closet inside the main door upstairs and there's a coat closet under the stairs downstairs. So we keep them in both places. So I looked in both places and it's, it was actually hard for me to count how many coats, coats that I own. It isn't that I have that many. Um, but like when I have winter coats, I have lightweight jackets, I have a couple raincoats, I have camouflage jackets just for hunting, I have um, suit jackets. I don't know if you count them as coats. I have overcoats to go when I wear a suit. I have two overcoats. One is lightweight and like if it's raining and one is heavier if it's cold out. Um, and I have hoodies. I have some zip down hoodies and I have some pull over your head hoodies. If you don't count the pull over the head hoodies, I'll count them as sweatshirts. Anyway, if I count all my coats, I actually had less than I expected. If you include all of those things, um, I have roughly 15 coats. I had rough, about four winter jackets and like I said, a couple of raincoats and then some lightweight jackets. So 15 to me actually doesn't sound like a lot. I thought I would have had more than that. Um, but I'm asking you this, and coats are pretty easy um, because of what Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 3, verse 11. I'm going to read the English Standard Version. Jesus taught us in Luke 3, 11. Whoever has two tunics, let's use the word coats, Whoever has two coats is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. 
So, Jesus, I don't have two coats. I have 15. Ironically, this past week, a friend of mine posted on Facebook that there was a fire and he lost a bunch of his winter clothes. And I had just read this and was preparing the sermon. And I wrote the guy, instead of posting on Facebook, where everybody could see like my generous offer, um, which is real hypocrisy, but um, I sent him a personal message. I said, hey, I could help you get some clothing. And I wear a size extra large. If you need any you know, winter coats or anything, uh, I have plenty I could give you. And he really appreciated that. It was, it's a pastor, a part-time pastor. Um, and... You read something like this, and we really need to take Scripture seriously. Listen, listen to what Jesus said. Whoever has two, the word isn't really that important, tunics, coats. Some English translations um, where it says tunics in the ESV, sometimes, sometimes it's translated as shirts. Now, you may remember years ago, I counted how many shirts I own. Oh my, I own about 10 shirts for every coat I own. <laughs> it is that bad because I have so many different types of shirts. I mean, like right now I'm wearing two shirts. There's an undershirt and this shirt here. Um, you know, I don't spend a lot of money on those things, so I don't be, feel too guilty. This shirt I bought at a thrift shop, as I often do, so it's used and it was inexpensive. Um, but there are people that struggle to have any. There are people in the world who could use a lot. And we really struggle with this. And notice what Jesus tacks on to the end of this. And whoever has food is to do likewise. So Jesus is saying, if you have food and somebody else doesn't, you should give them some of your food. I would bet if I came into your house or apartment or wherever you live, I could go to your refrigerator and there'd be plenty of food there. You probably have a freezer. It's future food. If you came to my house, yeah, we have a, a, a side-by-side -side refrigerator and freezer and then in our garage, we have an upright freezer to put even more food. And on top of our upright freezer, we have a little, you know, little refrigerator that we keep just beverages in. Most, most well, usually just beverages, um, like cans of soda and things like that, bottled water. Like we have so much, we have so much. Do you have an abundance? And I don't know if any of us would ever think like man, I just have an abundance. I have way more than I need. But the truth is, most of us do. And I don't know who's watching this. I would guess I could say to you, you have too much. You have more than you need. And here's the thing. We have more than we need, yet we keep buying more stuff. Stuff that we don't need. And I am guilty of this. And yeah, granted, most of my stuff that I buy is at the thrift shop or it's an extreme sale. It's, it's like cheap. Like I have benchmarks for most things. Like for a shirt, I wear a lot of polo shirts. This isn't one of them. Um, but I won't spend more than $10 for a polo shirt unless it's something really special. Uh, like my son's college, Messiah College shirt. It's now Messiah University. Yeah, that was a lot more than $10. But here's the point. We have a lot of stuff and we keep buying more. I would bet that if you're watching this, you're on some electronic device, um, I would bet that you could give away 50% half of the shirts that you own, the coats that you own, the pants that you own, the shoes that you own, all of your clothing, maybe except for undergarments, um, you could get rid of half and it wouldn't even reduce your standard of living. You would see no negative impact in that. Now, maybe that's not exactly right. I know there are some people that don't have an abundance, but if you're watching this, I'll bet you do. Go count your shoes. Uh, see how many pairs of shoes you own. Yeah, and I know they have all special purposes, and they have to match. Like, I don't know. I'm wearing brown shoes. I could wear... Yeah, yeah, matching. I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about matching. But we have all this stuff. Now, I would guess... And there's nothing wrong with having stuff. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having even wealth, you work hard for your money and you know stuff and the things you have. And I would bet that if I said to you, hey, there's this person that is your size that needs a coat, a pair of shoes or something right away, you might be willing to say, you know what, I have an extra coat I could give them. Or you probably are more likely to say, you know what, here, pastor, I will give you the money, go and buy them one or give them the money to go buy one themselves. Like, we are not cold-hearted. We do want to meet the needs of people. But the point is that we are rich. 
we are rich. Like if you came to my house, who needs 150 shirts? I don't know if I have 150. It might only be 130. But some of you are worse than me. And I, I don't know. I, I like to look at shoes. Like I buy shoes when I don't need shoes. I have too many shoes. And I could get rid of some. And this is where it's a problem because we're rich. Will you agree with me? Are you rich? Maybe not by your neighbor's standard, but by the world's standard. We are rich. Let me read to you that Jesus has an encounter with a rich man. And I don't have the reference here. All I have is verse 17. Um, bummer. I'll have to get Gail the reference for this, where it's coming from, and she could put it on the screen maybe. Anyway, in verse 17 of something, uh, I think this is John. Anyway, it says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. You just hear the pride in his voice. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds in verse 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declares, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Again, you can see the pride in this man's voice because he was keeping the tradition, the rules, the law. And verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus loved him when he said this. So keep this in mind when I preach this. Jesus says it with love. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. I would bet that you and I have more than that rich young ruler had. And the truth is, like the rich young ruler, we'd rather have rules to keep than give up our abundance of stuff. What if Jesus said that to you? Get rid of all your stuff, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Man, this is hard. Nobody ever said following Jesus would be easy, but nobody ever said it would be that hard. Following Jesus means leaving a lot of stuff behind, even for us. When we have such abundance, when you have this, I don't know what you can see, when you have this much stuff, and you honestly only need this much stuff, get rid of some of it. Start on this end and get rid of it. You know, my wife and I have a plan to start going through some of our stuff and reducing it. Now, th this is really hard. And you said you're rich, right? In Matthew 19, verse 24, Jesus says, Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you're rich, this is a problem for you, Matthew 19, 24. Because it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, th there are different ways to look at this. You know, an eye of a needle is, you know, biblically, I think what Jesus may be referring to is, it's an area where camels would have to get down on their knees, these rock formations, in order to get through them. It was hard, but not impossible. And we will cling to that. It's like, well, it's not impossible then. Who, man... Let's not put our faith on such thin ice because we might be wrong. And the truth is that we have a problem. And I'm not saying just you because we have a problem. We are wealthy Americans. You know, we have an abundance of stuff and we don't even know what to do about our problem. Where do we begin? How could we connect our abundance with people who have need? Like, I, I, say I decide to get rid of two of my 15 coats. Who do I give them to? I'm, honestly, I'm probably going to throw them in the community aid bin. Like, that's not giving it to a person in need. It's giving it to an organization that will sell it to somebody, probably me, if you donate your stuff to community aid. I'm, this, this, might, this might have been your shirt. I don't know. That's not how it's supposed to work, like us trading our abundance back and forth. <laughs> this is terrible. Um, so... The question is, are we even willing, if we could find a way to connect our abundance, and I'm not asking you to give up stuff you're using, stuff that you're needing, but 
I know that I have some shirts I haven't worn in well over a year. Like my Vikings jersey, like I want to wear that when they're playing in the Super Bowl. Well, I, if I limit it to that, I, I can't do that. But um, are we even willing to give our abundance to people in need? And this is where we have to go back to square one of our faith. Is Jesus enough? Is Jesus, in fact, Lord of my life? Is Jesus my master? Is Jesus your final answer? Because it is possible that we love our stuff more than we love Jesus. And of course, all of us would say, no, no. What if Jesus said, go, sell everything, give it to the poor, and then follow me? Would we be willing to do that? And if the answer is no, or I don't know, maybe we do love our stuff too much. And I say this as a hypocrite to you, because I'm guilty of it. And probably almost everybody that's part of our church is guilty of this. And it is a sin when we have such abundance and there are people in need. And we need to figure out what to do about that. I, you know, There are organizations that take shoes and get them to people who don't have shoes or have maybe have one pair of shoes. Maybe we could do that. Maybe you're sitting at home and thinking, you know what, I'd love to do that. Research it and find what you could do because we got to do more than we're doing. We have to love the hell out of people better. You with me? Let's pray. Father, we are so far short of the example your son gave us that we need your help. Send us your Holy Spirit. Give us a spirit of wisdom and help these words of Jesus and the apostles that I preach today not to fall upon deaf ears. Lord, I don't want to preach a good sermon. I want to preach a sermon where people will be obedient to the words that you gave us in your Bible, your words. So convict us and show us this next step forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
And now may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Go in peace and love your neighbor as much as Jesus loves you. Amen.